Welcome to the monthly truck stop webinar brought to you by the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation. These truck stops are presented the second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars are presented as industry updates for informational purposes only and do not qualify for state CE credits. If you're seeking CE credits, email our office at trs at ibci.net and we'll send you information concerning the opportunities for CE uh, webinars. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat window. They will be answered as time allows or responded to after the webinar by email. If you have video, if you have any audio problems during the presentation, please also type that in the chat window or call our office at 800-741-484. We'll attempt to correct the problems as soon as possible. Now let's get to the webinar. Today we're gonna to talk about the ELDs and hours of service training, bringing a value added to your customer or to your clients who is our motor carrier. As you know, our whole purpose of the foundation is so the retail agent or the insurance provider can be more of help to the motor carrier. This electronic log devices, which was effective in October, uh, December 18th of this year, enforced in April has brought a lot of questions, even questions from you as far as enforcement on the roadside, officers making violations, even changes made uh, just recently uh, last week. And we won't try to get update that. I reached out to our partners in this, and that's Reliance Partners, great members of the foundation. And they have suggested that we use one of their individuals to bring this program because of his extensive knowledge in this area. And with that, I'll introduce you to John Sedell. John, we welcome you here. I see you're in Washington, even though uh, Chattanooga is where you're now head headquarters. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and then take it from there, my friend? Okay, I want to thank everybody for taking this time to come on to this webinar. Um, we're excited about the opportunity to give you guys some value add to bring back to your clients. We understand that we've got some insurance companies, we've got some brokerage firms, we may even have some motor carriers on the line. So at the end of this one hour, what we want you to do is has to come on to the webinar with a certain level of information and knowledge, and then leave this webinar with more information than you came so you can bring this value add back to your customers. A little bit about me, I used to be a state patrol inspector in the state of Wisconsin. I worked for about 12 years pulling trucks over at roadside. Then I became an investigator with the federal government where I knocked on company doors and did full reviews of their safety. I was about 20 years in the trucking arena. Then I became a hazmat specialist with the FAA and I regulated airplanes hazardous material. Fast forward the last few years, I've worked in the insurance industry as a producer and a DOT consultant. I now work for Reliance Partners, headquartered out of Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we're excited about the opportunity to bring this information to you to help you guys going forward. So now what are we gonna cover today? The first thing we're gonna cover is this top topic called safety culture. When you do an FMCSA investigation, they have something called the safety management cycle, that's FMCSA trying to bring a value add to the motor carrier they just did a review as a safety uh, process to improve safety culture at the company. So we're gonna go over that model that FMCSA uses. The next bullet is rule dates, history. I'm gonna give you a little background on the ELDs. It's really hard to make educated, informed decisions going forward about ELDs and hours of service if you don't know where we came from. So a little small history lesson will occur. Then we're gonna fast forward to hours of service. When companies ran paper logs, I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but they did not have to follow the hours of service as scrutinized as they do today because the ELD, you know, I don't wanna use the word handcuff, but it makes them comply with the regulations at a higher level. So personal conveyance, yard moves, splitting of your sleeper, 16 hour work days, um, whether you need a 30 minute break or not are some examples of exceptions that have always been in play, but have been underused. They've been underused because you didn't have to use them with paper logs because you could just fudge the logs, right? Now, again, that wasn't legal, but falsification of logbooks has been an epidemic and a problem up until the ELDs. So then we're gonna talk about how an ELD works. In order to make educated decisions on inputting policies and procedures in place, you have to understand how the data flows through the system. So I'm gonna show you exactly how an ELD works and give you a couple examples of that. Then we're gonna talk about roadside and we're gonna talk about the company. 
So you can get pulled over at roadside. It can affect your CSA scores, or you could get a review from the federal government that affects the company. So we have responsibilities of drivers at roadside and management, but we also have responsibilities of company officials. So after we go through all this information, I'm gonna give you some value add as to what policies a company should put into place to improve efficiencies, reduce liability, and make the overall experience with hours of service and ELDs more effective. The last thing we're gonna talk about is controlling your CSA. What's interesting is everybody on the call with insurance, right? If you have a claim for property or workers comp, um, it's always a bad thing. So what we wanna do is we wanna prevent claims from ever happening. Once they happen, we wanna manage those claims to ensure that they don't get out of control. Well, some claims, no matter what we do, they're just gonna mature, like a torn rotator cuff with workers comp. So we just have to wait to see what those losses close out to be. Take CSA in the same kind of mentality. We wanna prevent CSA violations from happening, prevent roadside violations so your CSA isn't affected. But once you do get the roadsides, we wanna do data cues to challenge ones that may have been improperly cited, whether they're warnings or tickets on our um, roadsides. But some roadsides, we just, we screwed up, we did it wrong. So we're just gonna to have to wait the two years that it takes for these points to fall off our CSA system. So this gives you a pretty good overview of what we're gonna talk about now in the next 55 minutes or so. So before we get into, hey, we wanna reduce your CSA scores and make it so we don't have claims and increase your revenues and become a more effective company, what is safety all about? Safety is all about this screen right here. We wanna protect people. We wanna reduce crashes and save lives. The money will come, business will come, but the most precious commodity we have is people. So this is a truck driver who was speeding, driving too fast and inattentive. And he rear-ended a family about 10 years ago. Now I was an investigator when I first saw this picture and it was a news article that was sent to me. And this is what drives my passion in this industry, right? So if you look at the one in the middle, her name is Katie. And in 2007, she was two years old. Fast forward till now, it's 2018, she'd be 13 years old. Ironically, when I saw this picture 10 years ago, I said, come downstairs. And then I took this picture. The little girl in the middle is my daughter. Her name's Katie. So I had a girl, boy, girl, similar to that other family. So this hit home for me in that forget all the other stuff. Let's be safe out there and let's reduce crashes and save lives. But now that we've, you know, at least focused that as a cultural responsibility, let's get into the meat and potatoes, right? So now this is a safety management cycle. See how there's six steps. If FMCSA comes in and does a review at a company and issues them a conditional or unsat rating or, or any violation for that matter, even if they're non-rated or satisfactory. So let's use the example of false logs. Every company should have a policy and procedure um, restricting false logs, making it so they don't happen. So handwritten or implied via verbal procedures to run legal logbooks. Roles and responsibility, it is the driver's role to properly apply hours of service so they're not false. It's management's role to make sure that whatever they're doing is not false, even though we have a procedure put in place. So everybody has a role. Let's hire good people, good, hire good drivers, hire good safety managers. The next step is training and communication. What are we doing on this call today? We're training and communicating. Take this training and communication back to your companies so then they can apply the safety management cycle as I'm doing here. Monitoring and tracking. Should everybody monitor and track the use of personal conveyance, yard moves, for example? Because if you improperly use personal conveyance or yard moves, that's a false log. So you have to monitor that to make sure that the proper application is being applied. And then what meaningful action do you take? Do your companies have a discipline procedure, or even for that matter, a reward program to make sure that um, whatever the monitoring and tracking uncovers, that there's some action taken. And again, it doesn't always have to be negative. That action can be positive. So again, FMCSA uses this safety management cycle every time they do a review and find violations to assist the companies in improving. So if it's good for FMCSA, it should be good for you. So now, history of the ELD. I want you to focus on two terms here. 
One is AOBRD automatic onboard recording device. That's in 1988. Look in 2015 where it says ELD mandate. Um, that's what, 27 years later? So in 1988, they came up with a rule called AOBRD. That's 395.15. So that's 395.15. And then in 2015, they came up with the ELD mandate. So 27 years in between. Now, what did the technology sound like in 1988? Well, the internet sounded like me. Now, <laughs> it's funny, but you young people on the call, you're probably like, what is he talking about? But at least the old folks know what I'm talking about with our 56K modem. So think about this. Everybody running an AOBRD is following regulations from 1988. Anybody running an ELD is following regulations from 2015. Well, in between, a bunch of stuff happened. So see 2010? 2010, they came up with a final rule called EOBR1. EOBR1 was a mandate if every carrier that had a conditional rating or an unsat rating had to put an EOBR in for two years. Every carrier that had a that didn't have a conditional rating or an unsatisfactory rating was EOBR2. That was going to be a universal mandate for everybody else. So they had a two-phase process. They were going to mandate EOBRs for everybody who was a bad carrier in 2010, and then they proposed to continue it for everybody else later. Ironically, though, right in between 2010 and 2011, where it says vacated, OIDA sued the federal government. And when they sued the federal government, they, they tried to say that the regulation for EOBR didn't address driver harassment. The Seventh Appeals Court agreed and vacated EOBR-1. Now the government had a problem. They had EOBR-1 and EOBR-2. To solve that problem, in 2012, they added the two together and then did listening sessions about driver harassment in 2012. Well, right around 2012, 2013, MAP 21, which is an appropriations bill, got involved through Congress, and then they were upset because it has taken too long to have a rule put in place. So they changed the name to ELDs at that point. So it's an interesting history lesson is the electronic logging device name actually came from MAP 21 in Congress. So EOBRs absolutely never take, took effect. So the only thing that we've ever had is a true regulation for computers synchronized to the engine or synchronized to the vehicle that track hours of services, AOBRD and EOD. So in 2015, they came out with the mandate. So here's the good part that we have to understand now. By December 2017, you either needed to put an AOBRD in or an ELD. If you put an AOBRD in prior to December in any of your vehicles and your drivers used it, then after that, you can buy ELD-capable devices and run AOBRD software till 2019. So what that means is if you installed an AOBRD prior to December and used it, it is possible for you to run AOBRD-type devices all the way to December 2019. If you didn't install one before December 17, then you are running ELDs and you're subject to the ELD requirements going forward. Once December 2019 hits, AOBRDs will be illegal and everybody will have to have an ELD. So now the regulations, right? A lot of this is in the regulations. The book on the left is a safety regulation book for FMCSA. It's the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. If you go to any of your stakeholders and you say, hey, have you ever seen this book on the left? 95% of them are going to say yes. Then the book on the right is the CVSA out of service criteria. It gets published every April, um, which April of 2018, this one came out. If you go to your stakeholders and say, hey, who has this book on the right? The majority of them will say, I've never seen that book. What is that book for? Well, what that book is for is placing you out of service for violations of the book on the left. So every state patrol squad in the United States has both these books. They have the regulation book, then they have the out-of-service book, which determines whether or not the driver's in an out-of-service condition. As it relates to CSA, Every out-of-service condition is two extra points. Plus, you have to fix these things 
before you proceed down the road. So every one of our companies that we work with should have both of these books. And I'll tell you, the one on the right is probably the one you won't find very often. Um, if you want to buy it, cvsa.org. cvsa.org is a great place to find it. So now, this is from the rule in 2015. Everybody needs an AOBRD or an ELD. If you're grandfathered, you follow AOBRD. If you're not grandfathered, you follow ELD, which is the slide we just talked about. But they had three exceptions built into the ELD mandate. The first one is the 100 or the 150 air mile exemption. The 100 air mile exemption is for CDL trucks interstates. The 150 air mile exemption is for non-CDL trucks running interstate commerce. And I'm going to go through the details of those in a minute. However, if you do not meet the requirements of the 100 or the 150 air mile radius exemption, you need a logbook for that day. So this exemption works like this. In any 30 consecutive days, if you need a logbook eight or less days, you're exempt from the ELD, which we'll give an example in a minute. Drive away, tow away. Drive away, tow away is delivering brand new trucks. So if you are in the business of delivering brand new trucks, they don't expect you to put one in and then remove it and then deliver more trucks and add and remove them constantly. So you're exempt. The third one that was in the rule was engine year 1999 or older. So if you have an engine year that's 1999 or older, you're exempt from the ELD mandate as well. So these were the three that were built in. Since then, they have come out with a few others, um, rental exemptions, um, livestock, some agricultural short term, et cetera. So now to get into more detail about the short haul exemption, the 100 air mile radius exemption is not just 100 air miles, which is equivalent to 115 statute miles, which you can see on the bottom. When I say statute miles, I mean address to address. But instead of saying, well, I'm within 115 statute miles, I must be good. No, 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 no. You need to meet these five questions. You have to stay within 100 air miles, leave and return to the same spot, go home within 12 hours, take 10 hours off, um, don't exceed 11 hours of driving in that 12-hour period, and then you need time records showing time start, time finish, total hours. If you answer these questions correctly today, you don't need a logbook today. So for example, let's say you have a driver that always answers these right in a 30-day period. That means he needs a logbook zero days over 30 days. So he's exempt from the ELD. The next driver, he answers these wrong about six times in 30 days. Well, that's still eight or less. So he is also exempt from the ELD. Now, the third driver, let's say 12 days, he didn't answer these right. That means he needs logs 12 days out of 30. Well, that's more than eight, so he would need the ELD for the whole month. So companies can manage this on a per-driver basis to be exempt from the ELD. Now, the next one's the 150 air mile. This is for non-CDL vehicles. It's similar to the first one, except you get 50 more miles. And when you leave and return, it doesn't have to be within 12 hours. John, the rest of it is basically the same. Yes. I, there's one point I want to make here that we talk something because most of the people we're listening to deal with 18 wheelers, but there's less than CDL. That's 10,001 GBW larger, if I understand that right. So even someone like my son in law, who's a contractor in South Carolina with a dually, would be subject to that if they don't meet this exception. Correct. What that would be is. The difference between a commercial motor vehicle and not a commercial motor vehicle as it relates to CDL license is a combination greater than 26,000 pounds right. GVWR with a trailer over 10 is a CDL vehicle. A single vehicle greater than 26,000 pounds is a CDL vehicle. But any combination or single vehicle between 10,001 pounds and 26,000 pounds is a non-CDL vehicle which would be subject to this. And there are many companies that we insure that have some vehicles that fall within this. 
Right. That's that's the point I was making here is your contractors and things, even though our foundations focus on the bigger trucks, some of our audience writes the standard contractors and that kind of stuff, too. And they don't realize and most of the sure don't even realize this and they're going to get caught sometime when the officer gets real aggressive and sees that duly coming across the state lines with or without a DOT number and go through this whole process. That's my concern. Yep. And even on top of that, some tractor trailer companies have service vehicles where mechanics will run out and repair their vehicles within the region using a dually pickup truck. Those are subject to hours of service as well, and it's often neglected. Right. All right. Perfect. So I um, appreciate that, Tommy, that, you know, you interject like that. I mean, it's fantastic. So what we've just covered is this. We covered a little bit of why this is important, safety culture at the company, the history of the ELDs, what the timing is of it, who's subject, some exceptions to the rule. Now we're going to get into more bones as to how to efficiently use hours of service and what can get you in trouble with the ELD specifically. Now, everybody on the call, I challenge you to go to this website on the bottom. Federalregister.gov is where they post all new guidance, new federal registers, new regulations, proposed regulations. So if you're on this call and you want to be on top of your game and you want to be proactive, you go to this website on the bottom, you click on it, and then you get to this page that you see here. See in the upper right-hand corner, kind of in the middle on the right, it says subscribe. You can subscribe to FMCSA via the Federal Register. And when you subscribe, they will email you changes. So you don't have to rely on trade magazines or word of mouth or or truck stop lawyer to figure out what changes there are. You can monitor and track these on your own. And it's not just FMCSA. We probably have some OSHA people on. You can subscribe to the OSHA Federal Register site and any OSHA changes will also come. So I challenge you to do this. It's a huge value add that you can bring to your customers. So now, interestingly enough, just recently, they changed personal conveyance guidance. And this is the new guidance as it relates to personal conveyance. It says, under what circumstances may a driver operate a commercial motor vehicle for personal conveyance reasons? Now, what is personal conveyance? Personal conveyance is driving your vehicle in the off-duty status. I'll say it again. Driving your vehicle legally on a highway in the off-duty status. And this says that a driver may do that if he's relieved from work and all responsibility for performing work by the motor carrier. So if the motor carrier and the actions that the driver's doing are not work-related, he can use personal conveyance. But there are limitations. If you look a little bit down, it does not say distance. It used to say distance under the old guidance, but this new, dis this new guidance doesn't have a distance restriction. It does say that a motor carrier can limit the amount of distance, which I highly recommend. Now, the last piece is you can operate a CMV, a commercial motor vehicle, that has freight, meaning it's laden. Prior guidance did not allow for that. So the big change here is you can have a laden CMV. There is no reference to how far you can go, but you still cannot be working. So now the next four slides outline specific examples in which FMCSA are authorizing or not authorizing. These three examples right here are examples where you can use personal conveyance legally. Because of this nature of this webinar, we're not going to read through every one of them, but the real nature of this is if you're doing something to further the business, you're not going to be authorized to do this. So commuting between a driver's terminal and his residence. So if you're going home from a shipper or from the terminal, you're going to your house, like you're using it as a personal vehicle, you're good to go. Um, going to en route lodging. So you can drive to a truck stop, to a motel. Um, the third one is to a nearby safe location. After you load it and unload it, you can go to a truck stop, to a safe location, but it has to be one that is the most reasonable. You can't pass up 50 truck stops and go to another one. Um, if a safety official tells you, hey, you can't park here and you're in your break, this is now authorizing you to use personal conveyance in those situations, which is a huge change, right? Then it talks about motor coaches and passengers. And the big key here is you can't have passengers on board. And it did say that any off-duty drivers are not considered passengers. Transporting personal property. And then um, 
authorized use of a CMV to travel home, which is to and from your residence. So they have seven examples in which you can use it. I'm going to go back one slide, though. I want you to look at the top sentence. It says the following are examples which you can, but it says included, comma, but not limited to. Well, what does that mean? That means these are seven examples where you can, but there might be some examples that aren't specifically these that kind of meet the same intent of these. So there could be 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 different types of examples. They're just giving you seven of them here. So now the next section is these are examples where you can't use it. But again, included, not limited to. So if you are using a CMV to enhance your position to be ready for a load, that's work related. After delivering a towed unit, now you're bobtailing back to go get another towed unit. Well, you're going back to get a load, which is the towed unit. So you can't just do it because you're bobtailing. It isn't an automatic, I'm bobtailing, I'm good. Continuation of a CMV trip to fulfill business. If you're doing anything to advance the carrier's position to make money, it ain't going to work. Um, motor carrier, again, if there's passengers on board, you can't. If you're going somewhere to get maintenance performed, you can't use personal conveyance there. After you've been placed out of service, you can't use personal conveyance to get to one of those locations to get rest if you're in the out of service condition under 395, which is hours of service by the officer. Now, if the officer says, you know what, I'll let you go up to the truck stop three miles, that does trump that guidance. Traveling, unloading to a care, you know, to the terminal. So if you unload and you're going to go to the company terminal, that is also work related. And then luggage, where you're supposed to deliver luggage, even if you don't have passengers, but you're delivering luggage, that's work related. John. So as a yes, I want to stop one minute here because a lot of the publicity that we heard on the radio, and I listen to the Road Dog, Road Dog Radio Show when I can in the car and read the magazine, is that the truck drivers are saying, well, I just unloaded and I'm out of time and I can't get out of the customer's yard. I can't do this. This is relieving that. This is big move here to take that objection away that will bring it up. Well, I'm five miles from home. I can't get home. This is, this is sensible, adding some sensibility to this that says, if you need to get home and you're not working, you're unloaded, you can do that. If you unload and your hours of service, they'll get out of the customer's yard and go to the next place. This makes a, this takes away a lot of that earlier, uh, to me, John, you please react. To I it. can interject it on. Yep. So, so here's the deal. They have this thing called the coercion rule. The coercion rule is not, we're not going to get into it in great detail today, but shippers, receivers, motor carriers, and brokers. If you coerce a driver into violating hours of service, you can be subject to a complaint by a driver under the coercion rule, which you can Google that and read it. For the purposes of this, we're not going into great detail. Now, prior to this personal conveyance where you could have a load, if you were at a receiver and you unloaded and you have no freight and you're in the middle of your 10-hour break and they're forcing you to leave, you could have used personal conveyance to drive to a truck stop or your residence from where you just delivered because you're empty. Well, now that's different because you can be laid in. Now, if you're at a shipper and you're loaded and you're past your 14 and you're five minutes from your residence, yes, you can transport a tractor trailer with a load under personal conveyance to your residence as long as you're not advancing the position for that load. Um, if your residence is 300 miles away and across the street from your delivery point, it might be hard pressed to push that. But now it alleviates some of the responsibility under the coercion rule because now you can use personal conveyance loaded or unloaded. So what you're saying, Tommy, is 100% correct, that this adds some flexibility to drivers when forced to leave a location. But be advised, don't pass up 20 truck stops to right. go to the truck stop across the street from your delivery point. So that's personal conveyance. Again, driving legally in the off-duty status. What you have to realize is now that paper logs are gone, the government is just simply trying to add some flexibility to the driver because the hours of service are so restricted. Now, challenges we have as a foundation, and you guys on the call, is education. You need to take this information back to your motor carriers, especially the small ones, because a lot of these are going to hear about this through their drivers via the truck stop. And I don't know if you've heard the term truck stop attorney, but it's always a problem. So now, yard moves. Yard moves is legally driving your vehicle 
in the on-duty not driving status. I'll say it again. You can drive your vehicle around in excess of five miles an hour under the ELD rule without it putting you in the driving line over hours. But you can only do it when you're operating on a non-highway. Now, this is the definition of a highway. In that regulation book, the green book that was on the left earlier, it's any road or street. Well, let's take this one le extra level. Let's say it's your company terminal, right? We're going, to talk, we're going to think about a company terminal. Now, everybody's been on the call, whether you're an underwriter at some point, insurance agents for sure, at least I hope, you've been at your customer locations and then motor carriers, you know what your terminal is. Think about the parking lot behind your terminal building. Is it a road or a street? No. But is it a way? Yes. Is it on public or private property? Yes, it's on private property. So, so far, your terminal parking lot is a way on private property, which means it's still a highway. Is it open to the public? Well, maybe not. It's your terminal on private property. Is it passable by a four-wheel vehicle? Now, look a little below. It says open to the general public means without gates or prohibitive signs. So if you have a terminal parking lot that has a way passable by a car that's open to the public on private property, that's a highway and you can't use yard moves. So what would you want to do at your terminal? You would want to put prohibitive signs which adds the ability to use their terminal parking lot as a yard. So under the ELD mandate, they can choose yard moves and drive the vehicle in the on-duty status, thus not being over hours. It's a huge thing. So now next time an agent's on the phone right now, you go to your customer, drive in and see if their facility has prohibitive signs to the public. I would put signs up to say, not open to public travel. Now it's not just the terminal. This could be shipper locations receiver locations if they have these signs up and it's not open to public travel and doesn't meet the definition of a highway you can drive in the on duty not driving status it still hurts your 10 hour break but there are circumstances in which it will benefit you all right vehicle motion under the eld mandate driving time starts at five miles an hour okay so that means if you're not using personal conveyance and you're not using yard moves, it will put you in the driving status once your, your speed exceeds five miles an hour. Now, there are some vendors that allow you to put that at zero. Is it legal to drive under five miles an hour at a shipper for work in an off-duty status? The answer is no. I don't know why the government put it at five, but they did. So now there's a lot of trucking companies that are running under five miles an hour, their drivers are, while at a shipper to keep them in the off-duty status, which isn't legal. If they're in the same industrial park, you'll see them driving three miles an hour up the road in the industrial park to keep them in the off-duty status for their break. Again, is that legal? It is absolutely not. Now, the other part, though, is you don't need an ELD. This is an ELD mandate. You don't need an ELD if you're grandfathered. Is this five-mile-an-hour requirement mandated for AOBRDs? The answer is no, not necessarily. So some AOBRDs actually have larger speed thresholds. Now, from a liability standpoint, I'll tell you right now, I have a customer that got in a fatality. The investigator came and investigated their company, and five days before the crash, the driver was driving under five miles an hour during a 10-hour break at the shipper, and they wrote him up for a false log. Now in litigation, You've got internal data under discovery that shows that drivers are falsifying their log with this vehicle motion concept. <clears throat> so now, we've covered yard moves, personal conveyance, vehicle motion, split sleeper. Now this is complicated. In this webinar, everyone that is on the call will not understand this after I explain it. But drivers have to have 10 consecutive hours off duty. 10 consecutive hours off duty in order to reset their daily clock, you know, or not daily, I don't want to use the daily clock, but from one work time to another work time, you need 10 hours off. That can be 10 consecutive off duty, which part of it could be personal conveyance. 10 consecutive in the sleeper berth, which is sleeping in your truck. A combination of that total 10 hours, but the last one is you can actually get 10 hours off by adding two hours of off duty and sleeper or a combination to eight consecutive in the sleeper berth only. So you see here from 6.15 to 8.15, there's a two hour off duty. That two hours can be off duty or sleeper berth or a combination. Then you see there's a little bit of driving between 8.15 and 9.15. 
Then you see eight in the sleeper. You can actually add the eight to the two, and that is 10 consecutive, even though you have a break in the middle. Now, that break can be larger amounts. Now, the way you count this can be complicated. For the purposes of this call, I'm not going to get into crazy detail on how you count it. I'm just letting you know that I had a 40-truck company two days ago call me and say, John, these ELDs are killing me. I don't have any flexibility in hours of service. <clears throat> can you help me? And I'm like, well, are you splitting your sleeper? And he goes, you can still do that? And I said, yes. He didn't even know he could because when he was running paper, he never did because they would just lie. Well, now that he has ELDs, he's got to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, many instances in which you can use this opportunity. But again, for the purposes of time, we won't go in great detail. My contact information is above. If you want to call me specifically, if you have questions about that, that would be fine. All right, now, federalregister.gov, remember I told you to subscribe to that? Right now, they're doing a pilot project for split sleeper. They're making it so instead of just two and eight, like I just said, which, by the way, you can do eight first and then two. It doesn't have to be two, then eight. It can be eight, then two, but the eight has to be in the sleeper berth, and then the way you count it can get complicated. However, they're doing a pilot project right now where they're testing to determine whether or not they're going to add flexibility to this to allow seven and three, six and four, five and five. Now, again, that's not legal now, but in the future, do I anticipate that possibly be coming to fruition? Yes. Once that comes to fruition, think about it. You drive for a little bit, you get to a shipper, he delays you for four hours off duty in the break room. You can use that whole four hours if this comes to fruition, add it to six hours, get your 10 hour break. So then those delays won't hurt you as much where right now you can have a two hour delay and add that to the eight and that helps you. Um, so how do you keep up on this split sleeper birth pilot to see where it goes? Go to that federal register website and subscribe. And when they send you this stuff, actually read it. Right. Or John, so now, <clears throat> yeah. that's suggestion. Stay tuned to us because when it happens, I'll have you back on here. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Yeah, it's no problem. I mean, right, no. no, this is important. The good, this is what the foundation is for yeah. us, this kind of information. Yeah, and I'll tell you, think about what the government is doing. They just published new personal conveyance guidance to add extra flexibility to make the driver's life easier and better, but still compliant, right? Last, last week, yes. Yep, and they're also adding an agricultural exemption to help us get agricultural transported nationwide by adding some flexibility through guidance. So what is the government doing? With this pilot project, with those two things, they're trying their best to make this move to ELDs as smooth as possible. And we have to understand it is still the government, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, but these sessions are good because as they make these changes, the Motor Carrier Insurance Education Foundation in, in correspondence with Reliance Partners or whoever else it may be, come on here and educate our stakeholders. And we as insurance agents and underwriters, we're a key to that, especially our safety people. So it's very important. So now, 30 minute break. You have to have a 30 minute rest break um, at the eighth hour. So for example, or before the eighth hour, if you start at 6 a.m. at 2 p.m., you cannot drive anymore unless you take a 30 minute break. Now, what did I focus on? I said, if you start at 6 a.m. at 2 p.m., for example, eight hours later, you cannot drive on a highway again without taking a 30-minute break. But let's say you started at 6, you got to a shipper at 2. And when you got to the shipper, the loading dock door is empty, but you need a 30-minute break. But it's a yard. You could push yard moves, drive around in the on-duty status, which is not driving, and actually work 9 or 10 hours and then take your 30 minute break before you drive onto a highway. If you polled 100 drivers and said, can you drive, or no, can't cancel, can you work after the eighth hour without a 30 minute break? 90 out of 100 drivers that say, no, you need a 30 minute break before the eighth hour, not true. You can take a 30 minute break at the 10th hour, as long as after the eighth hour you didn't drive on a highway. So you could do six to two, two hours yard moves, a 30 minute break and go. That adds flexibility to our drivers. So knowledge is power. If you want to be a 
proactive agent stakeholder in the United States of America, start to learn these things and bring it to your carriers because compliance means low CSA. Low CSA means no visit from the government. No visit from the government means satisfactory rating. Compliance with CSA satisfactory rating should mean less losses. Less losses means less premium for your customers. So this is what we should all strive to be. So now the next one is called <clears throat> the 16 hour exemption. If you have a driver that leaves and returns to the same spot, the last five duty tours, meaning days they worked, they can actually have one day in excess of the 14 hour rule. They can go all the way to 16 hours. So normally you start at 6 a.m. <clears throat> at 8 p.m. you cannot drive anymore. I said it again, 6 a.m. at 8 p.m. 14 hours later you cannot drive. However, if you left and returned to the same spot, the last five duty tours, once every six days, you can drive and work, drive past the 14th all the way up to the 16th, as long as you're not over the 11 hours driving in that period, right? So now, can you do it more than once every six days? Yes. If the driver has 34 consecutive hours off, you can actually do it more than once. So construction guys, Tommy, you had brought up construction companies. It's the perfect example for them. Construction guys usually leave and return to the same spot. And they always do it for every day. They, you know, not always, but a lot of them always come back to their terminal. They're subject to the 14 hour days. And they're off on Sundays, which would be a restart. The end of Saturday, Sunday, and Monday morning would be 34 hours off. So what that basically means is Monday through Saturday, they can do one 16 hour day Monday through Saturday. If they get the restart on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, then Monday they can do it again. So you can do a 16 hour day on Friday and turn around and do another one on Monday, which is more than once every six consecutive days, but you had a restart in between. Construction companies, this is huge for them because the job site might get extended past that time. Now, can you drive more than 11? Well, that's not a problem for construction companies because they'll never hit 11 hours of driving time anyway because they're going to a job site for the most part, right? So now for the over the road guy, can he use it? Of course, um, but he has to leave and return. So he can't do it if he's nationwide, but he can do it if he's regional, home every night, fair enough. Now, can you exceed the 11 hours of driving? I don't have a slide for this, but there's this thing called adverse conditions. Yes, you can. You can drive from 11 to 13 hours if you can prove there was unanticipated weather, emergency conditions, road, con not road construction, but accidents. A good way to prove that there were adverse con conditions, emergency conditions, is a camera system. Go out and buy cameras. They help in litigation for insurance, but they would also help if you drove by an accident scene, use this adverse conditions, you're at the 12th hour of driving, you get pulled over and the officer's like, why are you over the 11? Because I had an accident I didn't anticipate. Oh, I don't believe you. Well, can I show you my camera? Boom. All right. So now we've talked about some of the hours of service and how you can use those to your advantage and stay compliant. Personal conveyance, yard moves, the bad thing about driving under five miles an hour, um, splitting your sleeper, 30-minute exemption. Oh, I forgot to tell you. A 100 air mile radius driver for CDL and a 150 air mile radius driver for non-CDL. If on a given day you meet those five questions, you don't need a 30 minute break that day. That adds to efficiencies. That's a value add for your customers, right? So now how does this thing work? Here I have a truck at the bottom left hand corner. You see the truck here? There's an engine and there's a computer module inside the engine. Whether it's a dedicated device or a bring your own device, um, the engine sends that data to the devices. So the five miles an hour is actually dictated by the engine. Then it also has GPS. So it's gaining locations every hour and every change of duty status. So what the driver does is he enters into this device right here. And when he enters into this device, that device now knows he's driving. So when he steps on the gas at five miles an hour, it's going to put him in the driving line over here on this logbook, right? Then if he stops for five minutes, it's going to default him to on-duty not driving, which is line four, and put him in the work status. If the driver wants to be off-duty, drive at five miles an hour, and be off-duty again, he would just have to push a button in the device saying he's off-duty. So what does the driver have to do? He has to log in, 
drive away. If he wants to be on duty, he can ignore it. If he needs to be off duty or sleeper berth, he has to push a button. When he's done with that status, if he wants to be driving, he just drives. If he wants to go on duty from sleeper berth or off duty, he has to push a button. If you're on duty and you want to drive, you just drive. So once you teach your drivers on that, it's pretty good. Now, what's the number one way that companies falsify these? And you should go back to your companies and ask them these questions, right? If I'm over hours in Indianapolis, Indiana, and I need to deliver in Chicago, right? Well, how do I get my delivery done on time? I can log off the device. It's illegal, but I can log off the device and drive. This system connected to the engine, grabbing satellite, will send a report over to the company saying, I had a truck that moved from Indianapolis to Chicago and nobody was logged in. But that driver's log won't show that trip because he logged off. But his log will show off-duty Indianapolis, on-duty Chicago. Well, how did you get there without any driving time? So good managers will go in and monitor these driving activities in which they're not in someone's log. I'm telling you right now that we have someone on the call who is an insurance carrier or an underwriter that underwrites an, uh, a motor carrier, and some of your customers are purposely logging off to drive to get the job done. If anybody doesn't believe that on the call, then you're naive, right? Because it is absolutely happening. I'm not saying it's an epidemic, but it's a problem. And when you get in a crash and the investigator comes in, it's the first thing he asks for. Imagine defending that that the driver purposely logged off and drove so it wouldn't show in his logbook. So now, challenges at roadside. When you get pulled over, you have to show them the device. It might malfunction. Your driver has to enter form and manner stuff. You have to have an instruction card in case it fails or if the, you need to pull information out of it, the driver understands. If it does malfunction, you need a blank supply of records of duty status. Um, improper usage of non-driving statuses. We're gonna talk about that too. Um, so visibility at roadside, what do you have to have? You have to have a graph grid display under the ELD mandate. Now we're talking ELDs at roadside. You have to show the officer today in the previous seven and all required ELD information. If you get pulled over as an AOBRD, you have to show them all the required AOBRD information. The AOBRDs did not require a graph grid display. Most have it, but some don't. So when you're at roadside, this is the interesting part that I'll say now, if you're a grandfathered AOBRD and you have an AOBRD without a graph grid display, it'll still have information the driver needs to pull up and show the officer, but you can't be cited for not having a graph grid because it's not in the regulation for AOBRDs. Fast John, forward, yes. I, I went back. We had that question that came up this way. And the thing is that we got to understand, because that was a question that the, the, uh, the hard, uh, that fixed the, L, the ELD hard drive and the officer couldn't see it. The officer does not get in the cab. The officer's got to be able to see it through the window or have a display that's put it there. That's a, as they put these things in their trucks. Remember that question they had here, but this yep, is yep. What, what the driver does not get in the cab. So this has to be this available to the, to the officer without the driver being in the cab. Without the inspector being in the cab. Right, right. So, yep. so, here, so here's the deal. The ELD mandate says it has to be reasonably, review, reasonably viewed from outside the vehicle. Right. It can be permanently mounted, but that mount has to be in a way where all the required information is visible from the window or the cab of the door or the passenger side. Right. You have to be able to show them that. Now, a lot of the devices that bring your own devices or even some of the tablets, they're removable and you can hand it to the officer. That's much better. Would I really want to go down the road? Not necessarily of having a device that's mounted that I can't remove. It's not that it's a violation, but it better be mounted in a manner so the officer can see it without his gun being exposed to the driver by reaching over the driver to look at it. So that's the reason. If it's in the middle of the truck, the officer reaches over to look at it and push buttons or whatever, and his gun is like six inches from the guy in the driver's seat, and it's a safety concern. And I used to be a state patrol inspector, so believe me, I understand that safety concern. But now to go further though, that has to be reasonably review, viewed from outside the vehicle under the ELD mandate. That was not required for AOBRD. So if you're a grandfathered AOBRD, they can't cite you for that, right? So now that brings home a, a valuable thing with this slide. If you're grandfathered, Every trucking company should teach their drivers when they get pulled over and the officer says, let me see your ELD. They should immediately say, 
sir, I don't have an ELD. I have an AOBRD. The reason you want to say that is because then the officer has the mindset of applying the standard from 395.15 and not the standard from 395.20 to 38, which is the ELD. It is harder to comply with the ELD standard than it is to comply with the AOBRD. And I'm not saying to get out of violations. All I'm saying is they both still track the data. You can still be a legal company, but you should not be cited for ELD-related violations if you're running AOBRDs until December 2019. Now, it says graph grid display for ELD, but you have to be able to show them the information. If you can't show the officer the information at roadside, no matter which device you have, you'll be placed out of service for no logbook. Now, this one on the bottom, it's called VDO Road Log. It's the only one that prints. This is heat paper, and it's got like heat printer. It's um, a version of Continental Tires. I'm not endorsing it. I'm just saying it's the only one that has a paper printout. Everybody else has a display. The reason the regulation even has a requirement and allowment for a printout instead of the display is because VDO road log was in the market, to be honest with you, right? So now that is roadside, whether you have an AOBRD or ELD. This slide is just ELD. If you have an AOBRD, you don't have to do this. However, it's an out-of-service criteria item. So when you have like a national road check for hours of service, um, which we had a little bit ago, um, if you have a national road check for hours of service and they cite an AOBRD uh, motor carrier for fair to transfer a data file, that's an improper cite. So what they're doing when they're ELDs is there's data inside the ELD. If the officer doesn't want to look at the display or the printout, he can say, send me a data file. They have a program called ERODS, and this is an actual version of what it looks like, right? So then there's 371 devices on the registered list right now for ELDs. Officers can't be expected to understand how to operate 371 of them. So instead, there's a data file that allows them to upload the data into their own software, and no matter what one of the 371 you have, the officer only needs to learn one software program. It is a very good way of going about it. And there's two options. Some vendors are web and email. Other ones are USB or Bluetooth. Most of them, most of them are web and email. Very few are using the local Bluetooth or USB to transfer this data file. But again, that's an ELD requirement. What if the device fails? If the device fails, you have to take those paper logs and reconstruct the device's log via paper for the period of failure. Not a whole eight days yet, just reconstruct for the period of failure. Now, you don't have to reconstruct the whole eight days if you can possess them from the system, whether it's electronically, via like a driver portal through the device, or printed PDFs from your, from your motor carrier. If you have them in your pocket or you have electronic access to them, you can, that's possessing them when it malfunctions um, so you can reconstruct the logs. Accessing them from the ELD, as long as you can still see the previous days, even though it's malfunctioning now, um, all you have to do is fill out paper logs for the period of malfunction and then just show the officer the last eight days. Now, ELDs, ELDs have to be repaired within eight days. So if you don't repair an ELD within eight days, you potentially are going to be placed out of service. So now the question is, how confident are you that you picked a device of those 371 that can get you what you need to get it repaired in eight days? And I'm telling you, overall, I'm not very confident. Form and manner. An ELD has to have this form and manner. AOBRDs do also. I'll tell you that two of the most cited form and manner violations are shipping ID and trailer number. So make sure that your motor carrier drivers are entering trailer number and shipping idea, ID, like would be a, a shipper and commodity description or a bill lading number or something like that. Now, um, this is the, one of the more commonly things that are cited at roadside. A good ELD slash AOBRD will populate the rest of this. This is what's required for an ELD header. Now, at roadside, you need an instruction card and a blank set of logs. You need a blank set of logs to make sure that you have something to fill out if there's a malfunction. You need the instruction card to help the driver pull the data out that's required as part of the display. You also need an instruction card explaining how to transfer the data file. You also need an instruction card on how to handle malfunctions. So there's a series of things that you need in the instruction card. Now, interestingly enough, the instruction card information 
is different for AOBRDs than ELDs. So if you get cited for having your instruction card inadequate because it doesn't have information on how to transfer a data file, but you're running an AOBRD, well, then that's an inappropriate site because under the AOBRD regulations, there is no requirement to transfer a data file, so you don't need a card explaining how to do it. And a lot of officers don't understand some of those nuances. This one is interesting in that it's messaging. If you send repeated messages in the furtherance of your commercial business, that is considered on duty. And it's text messages, emails, instant messages, anything transmitted. So pretend you're an insurance guy, an underwriter, or you're an agent, or even a motor carrier, or a driver, and you get in a bad fatality, and they subpoena the driver records and find out he was sending work-related text and email messages during his previous 30-minute break and his 10-hour break. And you as a company routinely solicit him to provide you information during his breaks. This is a guidance question that clearly says work-related messages are considered work. And if you're getting breaks and having these in the breaks under discovery, that can hurt you. All right, out of service, 4-1 of 18. They have out of service criteria where you're placed out of service since April 1st, 2018. Most of these are ELD related. One is you're driving without either an AOBRD or an ELD. Second one is you can't transfer the data file. Should you be required to transfer the data file if you're a grandfathered AOBRD? No. So can you be placed out of service for not transferring the data file until you're running an ELD, which in most cases nationwide isn't going to be until 2019? I can tell you right now, officers are citing people and putting them out of service for not transferring data files when in reality they're not required to do so. That's when you would file a data queue. Using a special category, that would be like agricultural, personal conveyance, um, 100 air mile radius exempt driver, 99 engine. You're claiming all those, but you don't meet that special driving category. Fair to reconstruct a log, that's out of service. Fair to repair it in eight days, that's out of service. <laughs> Fair to log into it. Remember the Indianapolis to Chicago example of running an unidentified driver trip? If you don't log into it, which is this one, the second one, and it results in a false log, which is the fourth one. Those are all out of service. Driver required to have an ELD, but it's not equipped with one. If you're required to have an ELD, meaning you're still running paper at this late day in the, in the juncture of this, um, you will be placed out of service, but you can continue that trip, unload. You just can't be dispatched again to another location. Now, if you unload there, you can actually run empty all the way back to your terminal within the hours of service. Um, but those are just some parameters that are put in the out of service criteria. So now shipper of choice, a lot of complaints of drivers is, listen, I started at 4 AM. I took my 30 minute break at 10 AM. Then I get to the shipper at 2 PM and I want to get loaded or unloaded. So then the, he spends an hour at the shipper. Then he drives a half an hour to the truck stop, does a post trip inspection or whatever, does a little bit of work, calls the company. Then he takes his 10 hour break. The one on top is a shipper of choice. They're accommodating the driver. They're taking care of him. The one on the bottom is the same example, gets there at two o'clock, but the shipper holds him up till seven. Well, now there's a problem because the 14 hour rule is 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. If he drives after 6 p.m., he is technically in violation. However, motor carriers can allow him with and without freight right now to run this half an hour trip right here off duty to a truck stop. However, if your motor carrier says no, or they limit you to only 10 minutes, or if they put some parameters on there, they're not going to allow it if you have freight. Well, then they're putting the shipper in a coercion rule situation because the shipper can't rely on the motor carrier allowing personal conveyance. Now it's a pretty good defense, but ultimately, if the shipper forces the driver to leave here, the shipper could be subject to a coercion rule violation. So what motor carriers should do, in my opinion, at least try to, to not be in violation is in instances where you're at a shipper and you're loaded or unloaded or a receiver, you can use personal conveyance to go to a truck stop when forced to leave. 
that puts a procedure in place that alleviates a violation and a problem with your customer. Now, if you want to restrict personal conveyance in all other situations other than forced to leave a shipper, go ahead. Like if you don't want the driver to be able to drive to and from his residence or it's too far, so be it. But it would be my thought that almost every motor carrier should at least consider using personal conveyance when your driver's in a situation where he's being forced to leave a lot and there's a truck stop up the road. All right, what policies do you need? Well, given this new personal conveyance, I think everybody should be going crazy right now writing new personal conveyance policies. Let's redo our handbook. <laughs> you should have a yard moves policy. You should have a force to leave a location policy where you could say the only times in which we authorize personal conveyance is situations in which you're forced to leave a shipper. Messaging while off duty, that'd be a good one. Vehicle motion setting, if you're gonna have it at five miles an hour, you better tell drivers that they're not allowed to be driving under five miles an hour. A discipline policy. If you don't follow any of the stuff we talked about here, it's always good to have a discipline policy using the safety management cycle that I started this presentation with in the beginning. Now, last two slides. <clears throat> Agents in the United States, underwriters, motor carriers, and drivers, are woefully inept and inadequate as a nation in properly filing data cues. Everyone is entitled to a mistake. If a driver makes a mistake and gets a violation, then we have to live with it in our CSA. But if a driver doesn't make a violation, but the officer makes a mistake in citing it, we need to have a recourse to correct that mistake, just like we try to correct our driver mistakes when they make a mistake via training and communication. Data cues is the means to correct the effect of CSA when an officer makes a mistake. Are we sitting here thinking that officers are smarter than everybody else? No. Whether you're a doctor or an officer or a teacher or a safety director in Burlington, Wisconsin, it doesn't matter. Um, everybody is entitled to make a mistake at work and we just have the means to correct it. So now, you see right here where it says analyst guide? If you click on this little tab where it says Analyst Guide, download a PDF file, which is 100 plus pages, it'll teach you everything you need to know about data cues. John, uh, you don't know yeah. this, but we have, a, we have a previous truck stop that goes to the data queue. And so if they're interested in that, they can just Google on our website or search on our website for that data queue uh, webinar. And again, it's an hour like this that, uh, that Bridget goes through and shows you how to do this. But that's a good point. Yep, and I'll tell you why this is important, right? Um, I, have a, I have a trucking company, right? And they had, um, they had like 650 trucks. And they had not filed one data queue in the last two years. Wow. Okay. So I don't know how when you go into a data queue system and you have 650 trucks that not one instance based on roadside, you couldn't see that an error was made. Now that error could be, I'll give you an example of a data queue, which is interesting. Let's say two headlights are burnt out. Your headlights don't work. A lot of people would be like, oh, that's out of service. Well, no, in the CVSA out of service book, it's only out of service during hours of darkness. So if you were stopped during the day, yes, you get violated and it hurts your CSA, but you shouldn't get the extra points for being out of service. Can you do a data queue where you only challenge the out of service nature of the violation? Yes. So that's an example. Now, would I go to this website to do data queues? Never. I don't advise any of my companies to go to this website to do data queues. I advise them to log in to the portal right here, get an ID, do the training, because there is a link to the data queue from this portal. What else is in the portal? Every other system that FMCSA has, and if you have a password to the portal, you have access to all of them. So why get passwords to all these different systems when you can just go to this location right here and have access to all of them? Now, when you do log into this portal, it won't populate the data queue immediately. You have to go into the preference in my profile, click on the DOT number, add data queues as a role, 
then apply it, then log off and log back in, then you're going to see it. Now, I hope everybody goes through those steps because it is somewhat complicated. But again, if you have any questions, give me a call. <laughs> All right. So now, um, those are a couple access things. John, that's I, a, I, that's that, go ahead. No, go ahead. So now it's on to you. This is your slide well, there, partner. Uh, John, this is a, a full hour and a few minutes off of that, which I'm sure everybody appreciate your time and effort. Thank you a lot. Uh, the people are hearing this. John's going to be at the annual conference dealing with hazmat and a few other things. We appreciate you and, and Reliance Partners of giving your time to share this unique information with everybody so that they can help the insured uh, do better. We appreciate everything. We look forward to you listening to next month's truck stop, which will be on July the 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. With that said, John, thank you, and we're out of here. All right, thank you. Thank you.